Matthew chapter 20, if you'll turn there. Matthew chapter 20, we've gone as far as verse 17. First book of the New Testament, of course. If you're visiting with us, we go through the books of the Bible, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We've been in Matthew for a number of months. We've gone as far as verse 17 of Matthew chapter 20. And we do read, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and on the third day he will rise again. So Father, as we begin this study, we have a few minutes in your word. I pray that we would just be settled in our seats, free from distractions, to remember to turn those ringers off our phones, uh, because we want to hear from you. You have something very, very important for us to learn from and to receive this morning. And I pray that we would be a people that our hearts are teachable right now, humble before you. And so, Lord, we give you this time in the study of your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So if you've been with us in Matthew's study, we know that this is the third time that we've seen in this gospel that Jesus speaks to his disciples about his impending death. And here in chapter 20, he does it with a lot greater detail. In other words, first of all, the verses that we just read, he takes them aside on the road. Remember that they have left Galilee for the very last time. They're on the far side of the Jordan. Multitudes are following them. So Jesus kind of has this private uh, meeting with his disciples. And they are headed to Jericho, as we will see at the end of the chapter, and then make that ascent up to Jerusalem, where he will make his triumphal entry into the city. And he reminds them that as we go to Jerusalem, first of all, I'm going to be betrayed. And they didn't understand that. Matter of fact, clear up to the time that they have their last meal with Jesus in that upper room, Jesus is telling them some very heavy things. I'm going to go away. You can't come. One of you is going to betray me. And they didn't know that it would be Judas. They had no clue. Matter of fact, Judas was the one that held the money bag. And you give the money to the one that you trust the most. So they had no clue that it was Judas. Judas would leave that upper room. And Jesus said to him, what you must do, do quickly, knowing that Judas would be his betrayer. He goes to the religious leaders to betray Jesus into their hands. And of course, they would come to the garden. They would arrest Jesus. He would be handed over, as Jesus said, I'm going to be handed over to the religious leaders, and they're going to condemn me to death. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus went on a series of three trials, first before Annas, the, the power behind the high priestly office, and then the Sanhedrin council made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, who are mounting their opposition against Jesus. And as he is there on that illegal trial that took place at night, we know that they condemned him to death. They would put a bag over his head, they would begin to beat him, and then they would put him in a holding cell there at Caiaphas uh, Palace. You can see the excavations of that even today. Very fascinating to go there when we go to Jerusalem. They would bring him out the next morning. He would stand in the official gathering of the Sanhedrin, condemned to death. And then they took him, as Jesus said, over to the Gentiles, to Rome. And as he stood before Pilate, Pilate would have Jesus taken and scourged. Those Roman soldiers would make a crown of thorns that they would pound on his head, lacerating his scalp. They would mock him. They pulled out his beard. Isaiah says his beard was pulled out. He was marred more than any other man. He was beaten. He had a cat of nine tails that was put on his back. They would then lead him to be crucified, as he says, as he was taken to Calvary, and he was pinned to that Roman gibbet, that cross, as he hung between heaven and earth and died for your sins and my sins. But as he talked about his impending suffering, and he suffered in ways that we can't fully understand, 
that he was truly the lamb that was led to the slaughter. But as he talked about his impending death, he never talked about his death without also talking about coming back to life, that he would resurrect from the grave. They don't understand that. They wouldn't come to understand that till after the resurrection. And in verse 20, in the meantime, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. So James and John, they were fishermen, their brothers, they, in Luke's gospel, uh, was called the sons of thunder. And they persuade their mother to talk to Jesus on their behalf. And so they come to him. She comes kneeling down, asking something from him. They, they come with their mom. And she comes to ask a special favor for her two sons. And when she comes worshiping him, you know, uh, I just wonder... Um, if at the heart of their mom, of James and John, was coming to worship because I want a big favor from you, Lord, kind of like buttering up God, trying to butter up the Lord here. I think that most of us, that we've had that happen to us, perhaps, that somebody has come to you, and, and they begin to be complimentary. They, you're such a wonderful person. You're a kind person. You're so giving. Uh, you're very special. And you're thinking, okay, here it comes. They're going to ask for a favor, you know. They're going to ask for money or something. And I think a lot of us have experienced something of that. But we don't know exactly the, the motive of her heart. But I just wonder, for you and for me here today, if sometimes our worship very subtly can fall into that category. I'm going to worship because I'm up for this promotion. I'm going to worship because I got this big business deal that is brewing. And, and we need to be careful that we're not worshiping it just in order to get something from God. Listen, we can come to him and we can ask. Jesus said, ask, please ask that your joy may be full. He would say to us that, as we know, that we can come to him and ask him. We know that the prayer of faith is not my will, but your will be done. Paul would say that we can come to him with prayers and supplication, with thanksgiving. So we can ask the Lord. We can come and say, Lord, here's what's on my heart. Here's what I desire. We can ask and pray for that promotion or for that business dealing or for that relationship or whatever. But Lord, not my will, your will be done. And Lord, I am coming to worship you, not so I can just get something from you, but Lord, I know that worshiping is giving to you. Because Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 declares to us that we are to offer up a sacrifice of praise. And Lord, I'm not here just to, to, to get something from you, but to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that is truly due your name. And as the conversation continues, and he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. I think that this is probably really just a continuation of what we have seen in the previous chapter. You recall that it was Jesus that had that conversation with that rich young ruler. He told him, go and sell everything that you have and come and follow me. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful. And if you remember, if you were here over the last couple of weeks as we went over that portion of scripture in chapter 19, then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for rich men to enter into the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard that, they were astonished. They said, who then can be saved? With men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And then we know that it was Peter that said, well, what are we going to get? We're not like the rich young ruler that's not willing to, to follow after you. We've given up all to follow you. And Jesus begins to talk about that there is rewards to be given in heaven. And we've talked about quite ex that quite extensively over the last couple of weeks. You guys are going to sit on the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And as Jesus, in last week, as we entered into chapter 20, would tell them of the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And now he takes them aside on the road. We're going up to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem, is what Luke writes. And I'm going to be crucified there. But they don't want to talk about that. They, they don't understand. They don't want to talk about his impending death. They want to talk about the seating arrangements in heaven. Hey, Mom, we want to get in our request in first. 
We want to sit next to Jesus. We want to be number one and number two in the kingdom. We want that position, position of status and prominence. And in verse 22, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. Now Jesus talking to them about death, they're still expecting him to usher in the kingdom. Matter of fact, when they come to Jericho, we're going to read how two blind men were healed. One of those is blind Bartimaeus. Uh, that's when Zacchaeus ends up getting saved, the chief tax collector. And as they make that ascent up into Jerusalem, Luke tells us that they're expecting the kingdom of God to be ushered in immediately. In that upper room, as they came to celebrate Passover, the disciples are arguing who's going to be the grace in the kingdom. So they have that mindset that the sky's going to open up, angels are going to descend, Rome's going to get theirs, he's going to usher in the kingdom. I want position of status and prominence in this kingdom. And Jesus, as he tells them, are you able, as they don't comprehend what they were asking, to drink the cup that I'm about ready to drink, that is the cup of death. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, the baptism of suffering? When they came in the garden to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out his sword. You know the story. And Jesus said, Peter, put your sword away. Don't you understand that I'm going to drink the cup that the Father has given me to drink? And these two brothers, not fully understanding what it means to be great in the kingdom, they said, we're able to, to drink of that cup. We're able to be baptized with that baptism. But they don't understand. How do we know that? Because Jesus said, you don't know what you ask. They are focused on self-glory rather than self-sacrifice. And in verse 23, so he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those to, for whom it is prepared by my father. So his reply to them is, you will be baptized with my baptism. You will drink of my cup. But he doesn't give details to them. Sure, we can drink of the cup and be baptized with your baptism. And Jesus says, you will. You're going to experience suffering and death. And it wasn't just James and John that would experience, but all these disciples that have walked with him would experience it as well. They have witnessed the miracles of Jesus, healing the people, the multitudes of every kind of sickness and disease, freeing the demoniacs. Uh, he was the one that fed the multitudes with the few fish and loaves. They were eyewitnesses of him walking on the water. And as they're expecting the kingdom to be ushered in immediately, they would end up experiencing the cup that the Lord had them to drink. They would end up dying on behalf of their ministry and for the Lord. You see, after Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, we know that they came to understand what Jesus was saying about his impending death and resurrection. And they would declare that as on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, that Peter stood up and he preached and 3,000 got saved. The next uh, chapter you see 2,000 more got saved. And they would begin to experience the, the baptism of suffering and persecuted very heavily by the religious leaders, brought before the Sanhedrin council, and, and they said, stop proclaiming the name of Jesus. You filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Wouldn't that be great if it was said of us at Calvary Chapel, you filled Greeley, well, County, with your doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ and him crucified. It'd be a wonderful commentary on our fellowship. As we go out and witness, they said, we're going to keep doing that. They were beaten. They were thrown in prison. The persecution would continue as this uh, Pharisee of Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, would begin to persecute the church very heavily in Jerusalem. It says at that time that they began to spread out to Judea and to Samaria. Just as Jesus said, you're going to take the gospel, be a witness for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. They would begin to fan out because of that persecution that, that Saul would bring, later on known as Paul the Apostle. But as we know that also in the early church, the first one to die of the apostles was this James here, the brother of John. He was taken by Herod Agrippa I. He was taken and beheaded. 
The Jews were ones that were pleased about that. And so Agrippa thinking, hey, I pleased the Jews. I'm going to get another one of those apostles. He grabs Peter, throws him in prison, and an angel comes and releases Peter. But we know that as they continued on, that these disciples, these apostles, would take on the baptism being immersed in suffering and they would take on the cup of death as they would die, be martyrs for Jesus Christ. Matthias, eaten alive by vultures when he was tied down. Thaddeus, crucified and shot with arrows. Nathaniel, skinned alive and crucified. Philip was, was one that was hung. Andrew was crucified. Matthew, the author of this gospel, he was beheaded. James had been thrown from the roof of the temple. Thomas had a sword that was thrust through him as he went to the farthest regions that any of them did that was up into India. Simon was sawn in pieces. Mark, who wrote the gospel of Mark, was drugged to death behind a chariot. Luke, who wrote the gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts, so faithful to Paul in his missionary journeys, Dr. Luke was crucified. We know that Paul the Apostle, the Apostle to the Gentiles, that he was beheaded, and in the same year, Peter was crucified upside down. And all of these men, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, dedicated even unto death, because they had seen the resurrected Lord, and they were looking for the kingdom to be restored. And John would be the last of the apostles to die as an elderly man. And as the church continued to grow, and through the years, that there was a new generation of believers that were on the scene. They were not eyewitnesses. Uh, they didn't walk with Jesus personally. They didn't see the miracles. But they were told of the words of Jesus, of his resurrection. And they would walk by faith, but persecution had come to them. And as I mentioned, that as Paul was beheaded and, and Peter was crucified upside down, it was by the hands of Caesar Nero, the emperor of Rome. He was the adopted grandson of, of Caesar Tiberius. Caesar Tiberius ruled during a time of Jesus' ministry. But Caesar Nero, when he was at the age of 27, in 54 AD, he becomes the emperor of Rome. He would reign until 68 AD. And it is believed that during his reign that he put to death about three million Christians. He would feed them to the lions in the arena. He would sew them up in wild animal skins and feed them to the wild animals and dogs. They would come and chew on them till they died. He would dip Christians in tar and tie them to a post and light them on fire. And there in his garden, and he would ride on his chariot naked with this hideous laugh, weaving in between the burning Christians. And he would say, you call yourselves the light of the world. Well, you are truly the light. He would burn the city of Rome down, and then he blamed it on the Christians. Caesar Nero would go insane, and he ended up committing suicide. After Nero, Vespasian comes on the throne, and he has Jerusalem destroyed by his son Titus, a Roman general, who surrounded Jerusalem. And we know when they broke through the walls, Josephus, the Jewish historian, writes that 1.1 million Jews were killed at that time. The second temple was destroyed. Not one stone was left upon another. And it would be after that that we know that his hand was lighter upon the Christians and bringing persecution to them because he was dealing with Vesuvius, that disaster. He would die, and then came Titus, his son, for two years after his father's reign. And then in 81 AD came Domitian. Domitian hated the Christians. He would rule till about 96 AD. He was even more brutal than Caesar Nero forcing people to bow down to him and say that you are Lord, Caesar is Lord. And whoever would not do that, which usually was the Christians and the Jews, were brutally put to death. He was not of a seeker-sensitive church philosophy, that's for sure. Ananias, Eusebius, Tertullian. You read the ecclesiastical, historical early church leaders. 
they tell us that John took Mary, the mother of our Lord, and they would leave Jerusalem right before Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. He would become the elder, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. That church was started on Paul's third missionary journey, and there was such fruit, and he had the school of Tyrannus, and he discipled men, and those men went out and planted churches throughout Proconsular Asia, which, by the way, Jesus writes a letter to those churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Tertullian tells us, one reference given, or it's church tradition, that Domitian knows that John, he's an elderly man, he's the last of the original apostles that is living as he is preaching this thing called Christianity. And there is one version that they took John by the order of Domitian. They wanted John to suffer slowly, not just feed him to the wild animals, the lions while in the arena before the crowds. They want him to feel pain. They want to torture him. So they decided to put him in a pot of boiling oil. They heat up that pot of oil. They lowered John into that as into that pot is the crowd screaming and shouting. And as he's lowered into that boiling cauldron of oil, John would raise his hands and he would pray. And he is lowered into the oil. He's still alive. And the crowds begin to be silent. They stop their screaming and yelling and cheering. And John begins to just praise the Lord. And Domitian screams, get him out of my sight. Get him out of here. So they banished him to an island in the Mediterranean. We are not talking about Tahiti or Hawaii. It was a rocky, barren, isolated island called Patmos. And Domitian thinking, if I can get rid of him and banish him, of the one who was the last elderly apostle, the one who walked with Jesus, the one who was an eyewitness of Jairus' daughter being raised. The one who, who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain. The one that leaned against the chest of Jesus in that upper room and heard the heartbeat of deity. The one that was an eyewitness of the religious leaders condemning Jesus to death because one gospel tells us that he knew the high priest, probably from his father's fishing business that brought fish to the high priest. He was the one that was an eyewitness to the crucifixion as Jesus commended the care of his mother into the hands of John. He was the one that ran to the tomb with Peter to discover that the tomb is empty. And he writes towards the end of his life in his first epistle that him which we looked upon in our hands of handle concerning the word of life. And John would receive on that island the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he would bring it back to that new generation of Christians. And it brings it back to you, to me, this generation. You see, they needed to know that Jesus was on the throne and he's in control and that he is coming back and he will establish his kingdom and the culmination of all things is coming and how we need to be comforted by that. We need to have that assurance as we read that book in the days in which we are living in, in the time that we know that it feels like that more and more as Christians in our culture, in our society, in our nation, that, that we are being dropped into a pot of boiling oil just to be fried and burned up, that the world's coming against us more and more. But are we willing to drink of the cup that the Lord has given us to drink? Do we understand that the world is not going to applaud us, that we're in the world but not of the world? And sometimes when we ask the Lord for something, we don't always understand what it is that we're asking, particularly when it comes to, Lord, I want ministry. I want to do this. We don't understand the cost, the sacrifice. We want the glory. That is something that's just natural. Lord, use me in a very powerful way. I want this powerful, dynamic ministry. Paul would cry out in the book of Philippians, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We like to stop right there. Lord, that I may know you and the power of your resurrection. I want to tell mountains to be gone. I want this great dynamic ministry. I, I, I want to, to have your glory, glory flowing through me. But Paul didn't stop there. He said, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And, and 
the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. To understand that in the sufferings and difficulties and the trials that we go through as we're living for the Lord, desiring to please the Lord, as we're serving the Lord, that there's a deep level of fellowship that takes place there. And Paul would write in 2 Corinthians that this light affliction that we presently now are going through is nothing to be compared to the glory that awaits us. And to know that he is with us and that he is coming back. And there's rewards to be given. And in this process, as we journey through life, walking with him, there will be a break in that will take place because he desires to work through us. He wants to humble us. To help us rely on him and get rid of our self-reliance And you know, I've quoted it many times before, that it was Tozer that said, before God uses a man greatly, he will break him deeply. We may not literally be put into a pot of boiling oil or have our heads lopped off, but there is a break in that will happen. And it was Paul the Apostle before he was beheaded writing to Timothy saying, Timothy, I'm going to be passing the baton on to you that in the last days is going to be perilous times. And know this, that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And here is John and James. Can they be number one and two in your kingdom? Lord, we want this favor because perhaps they're thinking we deserve it. We've walked with you for three and a half years. We're in your inner circle with, what's his name over there, Uh, Peter. We know that we are your favorites. I've had people come to me, maybe you've experienced something like it, very similar, but they've come to me with the attitude that I deserve this ministry, I I deserve this position, I deserve this title, and I have to explain to them that none of us deserve that. I don't deserve to be the pastor of this church. It's only by his grace. None of us deserve his favor, his salvation. It's by grace that we are saved. It is by grace that he's going to reward us. It is by grace that he uses us today, and I'm so grateful that the creator of the universe has a cup for you to drink and for me to drink. Are we willing to drink it? Because it's going to include us dying to self, and it's going to include difficulties and trials that come in this life, but the Lord will be so faithful. And when the ten heard it, verse 24, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Why do you think that they were displeased? Do you think it was because you guys are being James and John, so insensitive to the Lord? I mean, he's talking about dying, and here you guys only care about yourselves. Do you think that they're they're thinking, you know, you need to to learn what it means to really be a servant? No, these guys are upset, the other ten at James and John, because we didn't think of it first. We were the ones that you guys got to the, got a jump on the good seats in the kingdom. We should have thought of that first. They were thinking of themselves, I suspect. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. And just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus describing what true greatness is. It's not seeking prominence. It's not trying to get the glory yourself. It's not the Lord over. Now some of us, we own a business. We have employees under us. or We're a supervisor. We run our households. You guys, the priests of your homes, you know, parents. But there's a way to do it as we have responsibilities, as we're going to be supervising others. We do it in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. You can read about that in Colossians. You can read about it in Ephesians. Because everything that we do, we do it as unto the Lord, pleasing to him. He says, Paul writes, knowing that you have a master in heaven. So make sure that you're treating those under you right. And we can do it in a way that we're still doing it as a service unto the Lord. But he said, those who want to rule over, that just heavy-handed, that's Gentile stuff. That's the flesh. It shall not be so among you. If you want to be great, you want to be first, then be the servant of all. And this can be a tough one for us because we want to be noticed and appreciated. But God is the one to get the glory. The path to greatness is the path of humility and servanthood. 
And Jesus gives us a whole new way of thinking and living. Jesus didn't just teach it. He lived it. He lived it. And as he talks about being the servant of all, serving in humility and meekness and gentleness, it doesn't just happen in our own doing. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in us. We can't be the servant of all out of the flesh because our flesh rebels against that kind of thinking. It is to be God working and breaking and us yielding and resting and abiding in him. And Jesus, the picture and the example of the perfect servant, I mean, think about the creator of the universe, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the one who had the right to authority came to serve, not to be served. And he never asked his disciples to do anything that first he wasn't willing to do. He said, a student is not above his master or his teacher, but everyone who's fully trained will be like his teacher. He said that. When they came into that upper room, they're arguing who's going to be the greatest. He would gird himself with the towel and he would wash the feet of the disciples. And he said, I've done this as an example that this is what you're to do to one another. Jesus called his disciples to be with him. I've mentioned this before, but so often in the church, it seems like the more successful that a pastor, a minister, a teacher is, the more inaccessible you can be to people. And we need to be careful. I think the celebrity mentality in the church is very unfortunate. You can become more hidden. And it wasn't that way with Jesus. There are times where he got away from the multitude to pray to his father. But he was with the people. The common people heard him gladly. The good shepherd was with the sheep. And that's the mark of a good shepherd, a good pastor. He was with the sheep. And the further that Jesus went into his ministry, the more his disciples could see into the depths of his inner life and into his heart. Four things that I want to leave you with very quickly. Not only today as we've looked at this, but last week and talking about serving and rewards and all of this. As we look at these things, what would happen? What would happen to this church? To this place, Calvary Chapel? If we lived in the way that Jesus talked about and what the word of God spells out to us, what would happen if we truly desired to love each other and to serve each other? I believe that this loving servanthood within the body would captivate others who are searching. Do you know people are searching? People are confused. They're upset. They're they're. They're wondering, they're, they, they think, is this what it's all about? And, and they need to see truth, and they need to see God's love. And as we are doing that, humbling ourselves, speaking the truth in love, not compromising the truth, that as we're ministering to others and listening, that I believe that people would seek us out because love is irresistible. And people that are not believers are dead spiritually. And I believe that as we are serving them and being sensitive to just ministering the way that the Lord would have us to minister to them, you're going to see life springing up all over the place. You know what my desire is for the commentary of this fellowship would be? It isn't how big or you know, how popular any of those things. But my desire for the commentary of this fellowship is how those Christians love each other and they love the Lord and, you know, the lives would be impacted and lives would be witnessed to if we truly lived and thought the way that our Lord taught us. Number two, I want to encourage you, you seek the Lord and how he wants to use you. Yesterday I taught at a men's conference over 200 men. We talked about the church of Laodicea. That was my assignment. The lukewarm church. And they would have water that would flow down the aqueduct from Areopagus a few miles to Laodicea. And then the cold water from Colossae to Laodicea through an aqueduct. But they, by the time the hot water got to, to Laodicea and the cold water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Lord says, you're neither hot or cold. You're lukewarm. You're indifferent. There's no conviction. You're playing the middle. There's compromise. <clears throat> he says, I'm about ready to vomit you out of my mouth. 
the harshest words that he would say to all of the seven churches. And you see, as we went through that, it's a message for me because 25 years of pastoring the church, I turned 60, 30 years almost of full-time ministry to kick it in cruise control, to start going as we journey through life, any of us, to become lukewarm, and then we're not seeking the Lord, and we're doing our own thing. It was a couple months ago that I asked Sue, my wife, I said, what is it that you want to do? I've been ministering for 30 years. I've been here 25 years. Do you want to keep going? What is it that you want to do? I think she was kind of taken back because I hadn't asked her that for 25 years. She said, I want to keep going. I don't want to just live for myself. I don't want us to just live for ourselves. I want to keep going and doing what God's called us to do. And it was such a blessing to me. And it was an encouragement to me. And it built me up. And it's like, okay, then let's do it. Let's put our hand to the plow and not look back and keep going. And I'm going to keep going and teaching as long as I got breath. And I want to finish strong. What has the Lord been speaking to you? And I say this very honestly, very lovingly. But has there been things that have distracted you? The whole COVID thing, all the things that are taking place. That over time, you're just kind of... I'm not really going to seek the Lord. He has a cup for you to drink. He wants to use you. Especially in the day in which we are living in. We are seeing things all around us that are taking place that is screaming at us that we are rushing towards the return of the Lord. You don't want to be shelved in the day in which we're in. Don't quit. And I understand those feelings. I really do. There have been times over this last year I didn't want to get out of bed. I wanted to get up and crawl under a big rock and stay there for a while. But the Lord desires for us to move forward. And as we do, number three, you can write down, there is joy in serving him. Do you know that? It's not always easy. The enemy is going to come against you. He's going to try to rip your head off. Because he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And as you're serving the Lord, see, if we're indifferent, we're lukewarm, we're not a threat. But as you're growing in the Lord and desiring to be used of the Lord and live a life pleasing to the Lord, he will come against you. And it's not always easy, but there is a deep sense of joy in your heart as you're serving him. It's different than happiness. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances. Joy is just that confidence and that peace and just assurance and a deep sense of purpose. Because I get to serve the true and the living God wherever he has placed you, opportunities given to you, gifts that he has bestowed upon you by the Holy Spirit. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Lord, I know that you don't want me to be idle. And there's joy in serving him. And then fourthly, lastly, I do desire that you be rewarded greatly in heaven. I know it's all by his grace and by his goodness how he desires. As we learned of the parable of the worker in the vineyard last week. But I desire for you to hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. And as Jude says, that we will be presented before the Father with exceeding joy, faultless. And when we go home, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, that we're going to see our Lord. And as Revelation chapter 1 says, those eyes of flame that are going to look at us. And then all the things that are unlike him, the wood, hay, and stubble burning up, and all the things that are of him shining forth like precious metals. And I desire to hear those words and for you to hear the same words. Well done, good and faithful servant. That is our future. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And as Jude says, present it before the Father with exceeding joy. Not that you need to be introduced to the Father. But the Father and the Son, as you go before him, are going to rejoice over you. That is our future. And as we go through this life, as we stand before him, Paul's saying the light affliction is nothing compared to the glory that awaits us. All the trials and difficulties and the persecution and people that are coming against us, we are not going to regret it. But as we go home to be with him, we will praise him and look to him. And the Lord gets the glory 
But what a wonderful future that we have. Listen, the Lord's coming back. We're rushing towards the return of the Lord. I don't know the day or the hour. But live for him. Don't quit. All right? Let's keep running our race. Amen? Let's keep fighting the good fight because it's a good fight. And keep looking to him. As Paul would say that my departure is at hand, Timothy. I fought the good fight. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. And there's a crown of righteousness that is laid up for me. Not only for me, for all those who are looking for his return. And those returns are for eternity. Everything else here in this world is going to go away. And I pray that we would never have the mindset of I'm willing to trade that which is temporary for that which is eternal, serving the Lord. Yes, we have things to do. We have cares of life. We have responsibilities. But you live for the Lord and you seek him. Lord, what is it that you want me to do in this life? That, Lord, you have a cup for me. You have a baptism which would be baptized. I know that people will come against me. The enemy is going to try to kick my teeth out. But, Lord, I'm going to do it for your glory, and you are with me. David wrote in Psalm 56 that you put my tears in your bottle. There's a bottle that the Lord has a te- that he puts your tears. Anything that you weep over concerning the Lord and what you did for the Lord. He puts in a bottle, and that brings me comfort because he does see, and he does care. And I just wonder when we stand before him if he's going to take those tears and turn them into gems and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for these words that are given to us. We, we want them to impact our lives and our hearts. And Lord, at different stages of our life, Lord, we want to go to you, be sensitive to your leading, how you want to use us in the body of Christ to bring glory to you. And that might mean right now just being the parent and raising their kids or taking care of elderly parents or, Lord, just the attitude that changes in running your business. But Lord, also just desiring to be sensitive to your leading, not to quit, not to put it in cruise control, not to become lukewarm that can happen to any of us over time, but to really desire to live a life for you in every area of our lives, you the priority. And I do pray if there's anyone here or listening even online that you've never made a commitment to Jesus. He is your salvation. There is none other. He's the one that went and died for your sins and rose again from the grave. And salvation comes by admitting that you are a sinner. Repent, that means change direction, and turn to Jesus. Ask for forgiveness and for him to be your Lord and Savior. You can do that right now. That Jesus, I come to you and I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I turn to you now. I believe you died on the cross for me. Forgive me. You were buried and you rose again. You're alive. And I ask that you would be my personal Lord and Savior. And I thank you that you did it all. You paid it all. And I want to live for you. And I thank you. I now have this spirit of adoption where I can cry out, Abba, Father. And that you've brought me into the family of God. And I do want to know you and live for you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. And Father, for all of us as we leave this place, that you would just... Help us to continue with what we've learned. and Lord, look into you, given the worship that is due your name. And Lord, knowing that you want to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good.